Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have an old friend with me today. It is such a treat to welcome you, Ryan Haddon, to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's so beautiful to be here. Thanks for having me. Gosh, you are the... Director of Programming at Sage and Sounds, dedicated space for mental and emotional fitness, which is called The Study. Tell us where Sage and Sound is. Sage and Sound is on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Oh, I just missed it. (laughs) Dang. Where exactly? We're on 84th and 3rd. Oh, good God, right yeah, there. It's a beautiful space. I would have been walking over there every day. Oh, yeah. And it's such a beautiful time of year to be walking over there. Of course it is. Fresh and clear. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. You're a certified life and spiritual coach. You are a clinical hypnotherapist, something I love very much and have used myself. You are a certified meditation teacher with over 18 years of experience with hundreds of clients around the world. And you're also a sought-after public speaker for corporate uh, retreats. You've done stuff at CAA. You've done Tapping Solution Summits, wellness events such as Visionary Women, private sector government workshops. Wow. What I would like to say, I just want to give our listener kind of some context. Ryan and I know each other because Ryan's mom came to my class. And Ryan's mom, when I was in college and prior even high school, was one of those models that you just saw everywhere. And it was like a Christy Turlington kind of vibration where there was so much class oozing out of her and everything she did was so dignified and beautiful and careful. And when Dale walked into my class, I was like, oh God, I got nervous, like starstruck. Worse than anybody else. Like Julia Roberts has taken my class. No, this was worse. And I hung out with Dale a few times. We got to be friendly. And then slowly but surely, she introduced me to her daughter, Ryan. And Ryan has done some incredible work in the world, and that's why you're here. Today, I would like to talk about a couple of things that we've agreed upon. The first is, what happens when a door closes and one has to reinvent oneself, one has to rebuild oneself? I'm very curious to hear how this has affected you in your life and what you would teach to somebody asking this question. Well, yes, I have actually lived that many times, it seems, and I think anyone worth their weight in salt has as well, have had to face that door closing. And it's knowing with training and with deep curiosity, asking oneself this or something better, what is next? And knowing that in this refining period, we will become that person that will know if we allow that shaping to form and shape us, to not go underground, to be able to be curious and to practice speaking lovingly, practice being patient, practice um, being in this void, because there is a period where we're straddling two realities of what was and what is to come. And then we're in the center in the present. And so it's knowing that this is a very fertile and sacred time. And so I practice in that time, I've just coming through a version of that and sitting in that time and welcoming it and saying, come friend, what have you to teach me in this time? How can I sit in it with fullness, with presence? And how can I self-soothe? because all the programming is going to somehow pop up. <laughs> all Like, I haven't figured it out yet. Why am I not where I think I should be? You know, all those things and other people's pressing into you. And it's really sitting in that space and allowing it to do its work on you. Yeah, there's a, a level of respect for 
the reality as it is. Having spent the last few years studying Zen Buddhism, that's a really basic, main, central, fundamental theme, is respect what's happening and respond accordingly. Mm, yeah, so beautiful. <laughs> to the best of your ability, yes. One of those times in my life that really stands out was when I was you know, letting go of a way that I had coped and managed, and it worked for me until it didn't. And for me, that was drugs and alcohol and numbing out and showing up in people, places and things and grasping. And it really led me through the nose into darker places. And as someone who had sat in the sunlight of the spirit previously, who had a very expansive, connected relationship to spirit, and then found myself in this dark night of the soul of addiction was... um, just extremely painful and it made me question all my experiencing and so in that time i would say of being willing to let go of my definitions and my relationship to source my relationship to myself and really seeing how all of that had brought me to that now moment where i had built this house of cards and i think the humility in that and being willing to let go and saying not this way maybe this way really was incredible black belt training for the rest of my life. This, that was, I'm coming up on 20 years of recovery. So that was a span ago and lots of those versions of that, but not one stands out to me as much as that time and being willing to rebuild and have other people show me their experience, how they had done it. I saw them show up as parents, saw them let go of a marriage with dignity and grace. I saw them show up for themselves. I saw them build this practical and spiritual connection that wasn't these lofty transcendental experiences that I had had that I still valued deeply, having taken me to India and lived in an ashram for many years and sat at the feet of a great being. Those were transcendent and extremely powerful, blessed experiences, but I couldn't translate those into my day-to-day in a practical way. So in that time, I understood that I needed to rebuild a relationship with God and self, right? It's one and the same. And so that was a very fertile, beautiful time of sitting in the void of giving back all the shiny things, the things that I had worked so hard for to prop me up. And I just look at that time with so much affection for myself, so much awe. And I think anyone who's walked through a time like that and been able to come out of it feels the breadth and scope of it is tremendous. That's right. Yeah. I forgot all about that sobriety thread that we share. And we're almost the same age. How old are you now? 52. Yeah, we're the same age, 1970. 1970. Amazing. Blessed year. Um, We mentioned this in our sort of pre-planning for this episode, the frequency of self-loathing. I think it's important to address this between friends and here for our listener because our listener is definitely has in the some way in the past or in the present struggling with this. And I want to hear about how you work with your clients and how you've worked with yourself on self-loathing. I think this is a very practical conversation. Yeah, I think addiction, and certainly it can show up in partnerships. I mean, addiction is not just with substances, but it, it shows up in all kinds of fun ways in our lives, but that compulsion to grasp at things outside of us. It can happen through food. It can happen through partnerships, through relationships, through spending, through just our relationship to other, right? Or things outside of us. And it can create a feeling of obviously lack, not enough, perfectionism, less than. There's no other way to say it. And that in a repetitive repetitively thinking and negative patterning over and over again that becomes compulsive over time will create a frequency of self-loathing for sure. Maybe there were strains of it before, but in the extreme of that, it's very hard to come out of. So at the time in my addiction, I looked the part, I had everything on the outside I was married in a relationship and red carpet and all the things that I had been primed, you know, mentioned my mother, although she is none of that, never has been that. She has worn her fame or her celebrity and her art, I would say, very purely and has 
very much associated herself with the shadow aspect of it. It's more been about creating. And I think I loved listening to your description of her because it's true. She's a very regal icon of sorts in that world. And all the makeup artists, all the hair, all the fashion. They everybody loves her. Muse. Yes. And she everybody loves her. Clean. The designers. Yes. Everybody loves her. Yes. And she mm. always led with her heart. And so it's very beautiful. And so here I was acting out the shadow version of that, <laughs> going and trying to grab all the things and not finding my own purpose and passion, the grasping at the result of what those things can give you, you know? And so I couldn't find my own purpose and passion. So I saddled up to someone who was deep in their own excellence, in their art. That was a theme in my 20s people that were in their excellence, people that, because I couldn't quite fight my own. And that was a seed of self-loathing that grew and sprouted and took roots. I can't find my way. I can't find what my thing is. I don't know what my thing is. The irony is when you get up close to someone in theirs, it's attractive, but it also highlights your lack. And my mother never did that. It's just how I was primed. It's just how it was. And so then I was partnering up with these people all the time. And so again, it the seed started to germinate and grow and grow. And then of course, then there's an opening for wanting to take that feeling down a notch, <laughs> wanting to take the edges off of that feeling. And so that's enter the addiction. Yeah, I know it well, mm -hmm. really well. I want to also talk a little bit about how you got sober, if that's cool. Mm. We have a fair number of sober folks here that listen in. Uh, walk us through that a little bit. I'll say the first off that I love my story. I absolutely love my bottom. <laughs> I love um, where it took me. It's perfectly designed for me to get me into that tight spot. I know that I had been sober for a while and I met someone in sobriety and we had a beautiful marriage and had two children conceived in sobriety. Such a blessing. And then this crazy sideways idea came in my head that I think I can have a glass of wine with dinner. And that sounds good. It could just enhance all the good that's already here, right? <laughs> and that took me down a terrible road, obviously, as you know, I'm not going to go through the details of it, but it's well documented. It was a public downfall. And I found myself in a jail cell and my rage, my unchecked rage which I had been putting in a box and putting in a box and just came out of the box, let's put it that way. And I found myself in a jail cell and found myself with like-minded companions. And even then, I don't feel like I was done. I was still, you know, planning the next way out because when you're in that kind of pain and you're in that kind of self-loathing, the grips of that, because it is a gripping, I couldn't think my way out of it. I couldn't act my way out of it. I just didn't have those inner resources and I had built this life around me that was supporting it. And so I had prayed. I will say that. I had a moment of clarity probably a week before. I remember saying, God, help me. Just help me. And I remember that moment I felt it of that truth. I felt done, but I didn't know the way. And so looking back now, I know that there was that willingness. And from there, I went into a, a facility and I was planning my exit. And I remember just this counselor looked at me straight in the eye and she said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to stay. And it was one of those moments where you separate from yourself and you go, what do you mean you're going to stay? I was like, yes, I'm staying. I'm here. And from that moment forward, I woke up the next morning and I felt like I'd been spun off this merry-go-round. And I remember feeling like it's done. It's over. And my partner at that time still had more adventuring to do. And the people, the wise women around me who you know, really held me, kept saying, just focus on your own path, your own journey. And I was so deeply enmeshed with that person. And I'd always loved in that way, in that tight, controlling, you know, fearful, jealous, just contracted way. And it was such a beautiful letting go and allowing someone to be exactly as they were in all their colorful way, <laughs> in all their own journeying and to accept them as they are and just keep bringing the focus back to me. What am I thinking? What am I doing? What's my next right action? And that's what those wise mentors and women who'd walked through similar things kept saying to me. 
Mm. And it really served me well. So I could just bring the focus back to me. It's something I had never done. I had always been so externally focused. And doing that created this rich and deep connection that started really me on this path of just self-discovery for real, for because it felt good, not because it was the right thing to do, not because, you know, I had spiritual ego in the past, but because it really felt true and real and practical. And I went to meetings and I met other women and I started to have this little ember inside me, I like to say, and I protected it fiercely. So when any insanity started to come around or anything old, I would just come back to myself and come back to that connection. And I started showing up as a mother. I had really small kids that were four and two, learning to be a mother again and learning to show up for them. That was a huge self-esteem builder for me. I had um, outstaffed myself out of my own life. You know, I had all sorts of people taking care of my kids and I, I was just me and them. And we got a really small little house together, a little cottage, really life that was felt right-sized and it felt good and it felt mine and it felt real. And I didn't date for a long time. Obviously, I, we separated a year into it, but I went all the way through to the end and I was was such a beautiful experience of living along someone else's choices and coming back to my own. And then coming to that day and people, women that I worked with would say, one day you'll wake up and you'll know, don't worry about what they're doing. Just come back to yourself. And that day came probably a year or so later, it was maybe a year and a half sober. And I was going to Al-Anon and I was going to AA. I was doing all those programs and they felt really nourishing. And then women started asking me to take them through the process. And that service piece, that just lit me up. I finally found the thing I had been looking for everywhere else was in service, was in taking other women through what had been so generously and beautifully given to me. It was, again, that beautiful flame, just holding it gently, gently, and passing it back to another woman who had been in the same situation in some ways. And that really, I anchored into that, and that became a huge golden thread and has led me to today, really just a beautiful unfolding of learning and then turning around and giving it back. It's so beautiful to really focus a little bit on the service of that. If you're listening and you're struggling with any addiction at all, one of the great ways to move through it is to see yourself on the other side and see yourself helping somebody else through it. That made all the difference to me. Mm -hmm. Somebody offered to receive a text from me every night that I reached my bed without using. And it was like, oh, wow, what a wonderful idea. Yes, I'll take you up on that. And I ended up only doing it for a few days because it was such a strong hand being held out to me. And I realized how important it is to just do this for myself and to do this for the world and to then someday offer that to somebody else. I appreciate that you brought that up. Yeah, we take turns in the carrying. Yes, yes. And, you know, ideally in any relationship, friendship, partnership, even as a parent, like there are times when it's it's kind of unspoken, but I think it's worth speaking, that one of us needs help. And to understand that there is always going to be that sort of factor and to, you know, when I'm in a good spot, I'm going to be ready to help somebody else. And the opportunity will come <laughs> without question. Yes. Hmm. I had a mentor where I would call her and say, this happened, that happened. She would say, your experience will benefit others. And that phrase would always stay with me. Because like you, that then there's a purpose. There's a purpose. Not only am I integrating something and I'm learning and growing because I didn't have value on that quite yet, but I did started to have that that service thing, that idea that it would be helpful, like you said. Mm -hmm. So, which kind of leads me to my next question, and it's kind of a touchy topic, and I want to be very respectful of your experience and also of all the parties involved, legalities everything. This has to do with making the choice to move away from a teacher who violated you and to stop being a seeker 
and start really kind of resetting yourself and finding your own way. I really respect that you brought this out to me those many months ago, years ago, and it scared me. That's the truth of it, because I know all the people involved, and it's so sad. It's so sad. It's so deeply sad that because the nature of this patriarchal system under which we are living, I'm afraid to talk about this, but I do think it's important. And I think I would like to not name names if possible and just help another woman who might have gone through this and is struggling with some closure or some healing. Can that work for you? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Oh, my heart is crying a little bit. My eyes are starting a little bit. My hands are shaking a little bit. I would like to address in some way, approach with very great care your experience of this and in some way to help the women that are listening, one woman that is listening uh, with her own story to perhaps talk about it and start to heal. That's beautiful. And that is in the spirit of which I wrote what I wrote and sent it to you. And it's really just that this isn't unusual, that this situation where someone in an elevated position, someone with some spiritual gifts, someone with sitting on some power has mishandled and um, taken that opening which can happen between a teacher and a student because there's awe and respect as there well should be, you know, in many ways. I always like to have someone ahead of me that I can look to, be it a sponsor, be it a mentor, be it a coach, be it, uh, I had a classic Shaktipat Kundalini awakening through a very great being when I was 17 years old. So I really, there is a place for that. And it's very common that sometimes those people in those positions can mistake that opening as an invitation that is unwelcome. And if someone isn't rooted in their sense of self, doesn't have the boundaries, doesn't have the self-love in place, they might also be a frequency match for that digression, for that betrayal to self and with a teacher, right? In that partnership. Well, that's an interesting point, dude. (laughs) That's a really interesting point. If I'm understanding you correctly, so the perpetrator is also on this very low base frequency of self-loathing of some kind and therefore taking advantage of this window in a way that is so highly inappropriate. I mean, it's happened to me. It's happened to so many of us. So many. And so many different types of forums. Yes. Yes. And so, yes, and some are more grave than others. And I do think a spiritual betrayal is a particular or religious or anything to do with someone who's a conduit between a relationship, a deepening a relationship to source, creator, self, that is sacred, that is holy. And so it's, it has a little bit of a more torque to it, maybe, Um and it's just been around forever. We know this. And this is the time. I mean, this is an incredible time on the planet. This is, things are being brought up to be seen and to be, you know, as we say in the recovery world, just uncover, discover, discard. We're doing this. We're looking. What is what is this parrot? What is this blueprint? What is this, like you said, the patriarchy? What is this relationship that we have? Is this working for us? And so a lot is coming up and we're seeing a lot of traditions. I'm not going to name them all, but there's many and I follow them closely because it's fascinating to me because it's happening and it has happened. And I don't know why it happens, but I do think that lower chakra things get stuck in power and sex and those places and the transmuting is not happening. And that's not to say that these people haven't had great teachings and parceling out, sometimes I have conflict with that because you can parcel out the teachings from the teacher. But I also believe that as a teacher, our state is what transmits wisdom. So it's kind of a gray area that way because 
I don't believe as a teacher, it's not just what you're teaching. If you're not integrated with your teachings, if you're not of what you speak and you're not practicing it, it's really hollow. It's a hijacking of our spiritual program. And that's what we're trying to unlearn. These, you know, these programming is not in integrity. So there's a lot more to this, but I do think that it's interesting. And I've had many years, what you're referencing, that story happened many years ago. It happened when I was in a very dark place, struggling um, that first time before I got married, that time in my alcoholism. And I had been to rehabs and I had been to different places. And my mother was at her wit's end trying to help me grapple with this thing that I just stumbled into out of the blue. It's not like I'd had this long history and it was startling to the both of us and I couldn't get a handle on it. And so there was a spiritual community that was highly recommended, holistic, to go there and possibly adopt that program. I'd come at it a different way since I'd had a spiritual experience previously when I was younger, that this might be another place to do that. And that leader of that organization after I had explained, you know, can you help me? Can you help me find God again? And that's literally was my cry for help. Can you help me get back to God? Mm. And that is just so heartbreaking to me. I feel so fiercely protective of that young woman, that 20 something year old who knew that she was in deep trouble and came to a master of sorts. And that was mistook, like we said, as a invitation to, um, you know, explore that. The thing is, is that that version of me did not have the mechanism in place to say no to that. You know, obviously I'm not a victim. It does not come into my category and realm. And it's been a point, like I said, a few years ago, revisited because I felt like it was important. And I wanted to put that story out there in an anonymous way lest it find someone else who had experienced something similar. I'm sure other people have. I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm. And 30 years ago, however old it was, 30, 25, 30 years ago, that person could probably get away with anything mm -hmm. different from now. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm so sorry, a listener, I can't say who it is, but it's so shocking and like it puts a really weird, bad taste in my mouth on so many weird levels. In any case, the real teaching is, fuck them. <laughs> Those people are really sick and twisted, and we know better now. We do, and I think we've come a long way. I don't think we elevate quite like that anymore. I don't think that. And you talked about stop seeking, and it's more about really trusting that there are people that are holding keys there are people that have downloads and there are people that have information and to just take that information and run it through your own system, create a relationship with yourself that's deep and wide and beautiful and trust and invite in your own higher self. You know, more and more I have my inner child and I have my higher self that I connect with and that I deeply trust. And I know that the highest source of love in the universe is weaving through this partnership that I have, that I'm sandwiched between this version of me that is all knowing that has in the quantum field that is already as a realized being state. And then I have this beautiful, tender version of me that I hold dearly. And so between the two of them, I'm well stocked. <laughs> and so I, I think run it through those filters, any wisdom, any book you read, any channeling that happens. And there are beautiful people channeling beautiful information at this time. Um, but run it through your own filter. And that's the seeking that I was saying. It's not out there anymore. I think we know so much as a hypnotherapist, as a a tremendous power on words and how we use them and how we connect to them. And saying I'm a seeker implies somehow that we're still moving. We're still in motion. I'm seeking, I'm seeking, but not finding. I think we're found, we're finding now. So I don't identify as a seeker anymore, even though that's what we say in our community. And of course, I'll always be gathering information. But again, I'm deeply trusting that wisdom gets integrated through my attuned system at this point. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a hard conversation, and it leads in such a good direction, which is toward a really great 
freedom that I think, if I'm not mistaken, is really only found as one gets a bit older and sees with a bit more perspective all of those seemingly very contracted parts of life when we were in our 20s, our 30s, even our 40s. You get to a certain point in your 50s where you're like, oh, all of that was very important. All of that pain was hugely vital and it brought great growth to me. And now I can see with total clarity how all of those horrible, traumatic events gave me who I am today. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's so cool. It is. It really is. So cool. Is there anything else that you'd like to add with, uh, add or share with our listener today? Uh, anything that you're working on of late? Anything that you'd like to touch upon that we've missed? I guess I just want to touch back that if anyone related to having had an experience like that, to just to sit and allow the, to not carry that shame because it's not yours to carry. And so where can you come to, to be able to drop that, find that place, find that person, find that, whether it's through writing, with, through the process, to let that go. And what action can you take? For me, it became about this writing that I had done, this piece that I wrote, and having the people in my life go through all the beats of it, how this happens, how one comes to this experience, how one gives themselves over to it. You know, and I think so that was hugely healing. And like you said, that has happened many years ago. So it wasn't that I was carrying it as a wound so much as I wasn't ready to look at it in the way that I have from this place of wholeness. And so maybe go back and something that you think you've dealt with and it's okay with this version of you because we're constantly evolving. This is the best version of myself I've ever been in these last span of time that I'm the most in love with, that I'm the most connected to. So of course, this version of me would like to revisit that in a new way with all that I am now, with all that I've gained. And I can flip it around and really get closure. And closure is, you know, probably an overused word, but really feel that sense of how it's woven into how I am now. And that's the piece. It's nothing to do with that person or that person coming to me. And none of those things, I've set them free really, truly. And I owed myself that, that gift to do that. So not to be afraid to bring things back out if you're in a safe place to do it. And if you haven't dealt with it yet, find that first step, find that one place where you can unload it and give it back to them, you know, in some ways, or put it right where it needs to be. That It's not something that you carry and make choices around going forward to give it that power. Yes, I'd say that. How is your mom, by the way? She's beautiful. Before we go. She's so great. Yeah. Will you tell her I love her I and send will. her a big hug from me? I will. She's wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you for having me. Of course. Of course. What a pleasure to have you. Thank you for being here. And more soon, where's the best place for our listener to find you? I'm always writing on Instagram. That's my space right now. Um, so it's ryan.hadden. Ryan dot H A D D O N and Ryan is R Y A N of course. Right. Yeah. Thank you, sister, so much. Thank you. Wonderful to have you. Thanks for having me.